So we are halfway through the econometrics course and uh, so far we have examined how the classic Odin least squares estimate uh, functions and what kind of assumptions are needed that it will be unbiased and consistent. So in the next few lessons we will then focus on what happens when uh, the assumptions are violated and then uh, what can we do to, um, to uh, find a remedy for this, uh, these problems. And we start from the so-called endogeneity problem. And I'll first uh, illustrate to you why this endogeneity problem is uh, often the main concern for the econometrician. So recall from the discussion of the uh, statistical properties and the assumptions to, to ensure those statistical properties that uh, this uh, exogeneity condition or zero conditional mean assumption was really uh, required for all of the um, properties, so including uh, a finite sample properties such as unbiasedness and efficiency, but also asymptotic properties such as consistency and asymptotic normality. So uh, the exogeneity condition was uh, a critical to ensure all of those properties. So all of the nice properties of the ordinary least squares estimate to fly out of window if the if the exogeneity condition is violated. So uh, this is why I think it is important to not just memorize the assumptions by heart, but also uh, understand that what is their role and, uh, and uh, how serious their problems will be if, uh, if the assumption is, is uh, not satisfied. So let's have a brief recap. What do we mean by the, by the exogeneity? And uh, recall that when I, when I introduced those statistical properties, uh, so uh, this was in the, in the case of a single regression model with just uh, one explanatory variable x, but uh, the situation is very similar also in the multiple uh, regression case. So we derived that this uh, uh, OLS estimator for slope, so this B2 parameter, is equal to the, to the true underlying beta2 coefficient plus an error term that uh, that is essentially the ratio of the sample covariance between x and epsilon and the sample variance of x. So this formula is very uh, helpful to understand the, the endogeneity problem. So obviously the OLS estimator for slope is, uh, is um, unbiased, meaning that the expected value of B2 is equal to beta2 whenever the covariance of x and epsilon is equal to zero. Okay, so it's important that uh, that uh, uh, our explanatory variable x should be uncorrelated with the epsilon because in that case the covariance of x and epsilon would be equal to zero. Of course, in a, in a, any any random sample, this uh, sample covariance, this est cover, is typically not equal to zero. But for the unbiasedness, we we talk about the expected value, so the expectation of this sample covariance would be equal to zero. And uh, by endogeneity problem, we therefore mean that this, uh, this, uh, this population covariance of X and epsilon is not equal to zero. So there would be then some systematic bias and that would also uh, make the estimator uh, inconsistent and uh, also the statistical inferences would fail. So I also want to want to still remind that uh, that uh, it's perhaps most easiest way to understand this uh, exogeneity assumption that uh, that exogeneity we could we could define it as the assumption that the covariance of x and epsilon is equal to zero uh, however if you read uh, textbooks for example the textbook by Jeffrey Wooldridge then in in, uh, in those textbooks then uh, then the same assumption is stated slightly differently and it's actually equivalent to the zero conditional mean assumption uh, stated that the uh, conditional expectation of epsilon conditional on an x variables is equal to zero. But essentially, both are the same ways of, uh, both are equivalent ways of stating that uh, our explanatory variables should be uncorrelated with, uh, with this uh, uh, random epsilon. Okay. So on this slide, I also have then three common uh, examples of uh, endogeneity problems. So of course, there can be several different sources of, uh, of endogeneity. And uh, the purpose of this uh, 
this and the next few lessons will be then to clarify this uh, sources of endogeneity. And then as the theme number eight, we will then, then consider the instrumental variables as the remedy. But, uh, but uh, before we are trying to solve the problem, then it's good to first uh, get, get a little bit deeper understanding of the, of the source of the problem. And indeed, um, any correlation between explanatory variables and, uh, and the error term epsilon would be causing endogeneity, but the mechanisms can be, can be somewhat different. So um, already as part of the previous theme, I briefly discussed you about the omitted variable bias, and uh, in the following part of the lesson, I will then uh, clarify still a little bit further the omitted variable bias. But there are also other, other types of endogeneity. In the next lesson, I will then talk about the measurement errors in our explanatory variables X, and then uh, perhaps the, the first type of endogeneity where the name also comes from is so-called simultaneity bias. And, uh, and I will then conclude this theme with a discussion of that. But um, maybe in some sense, the omitted variable bias is the, is the most straightforward way to understand the endogeneity, at least in my, my opinion. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll start by discussing the sources of endogeneity from the, from the omitted variable bias. So recall that we, we already uh, discussed this kind of example in the case of the, the modeling strategy. So suppose that in, um, in reality, the, the dependent variable Y depends on two X variables, X2 and X3. However, we, we for whatever reason, we choose to ignore this um, X3. So there is a typo on the slide. It should be X3 rather than X2 that we ignore. So we only, only regress uh, uh, a single regression model that includes X2 but um, but then uh, uh, we do not include this x3 as an explanatory variable in our regression model, even though it actually influences y. So it's good to understand that um, that uh, of course we can do that. We can just uh, just uh, run a regression model that doesn't include all of the variables. So what happens in effect uh, is then these uh, omitted variables. The impacts of all omitted variables will go to this epsilon. And uh, in some sense, this is fine because uh, you never ever can really control explicitly everything that, uh, that influences the uh, why in any, any typical uh, economic or, or business uh, application. So typically, there is always some kind of uh, um, uncontrolled uh, influences to this, to this y, which just go to the epsilon. And, uh, this is the reason why we uh, do include this epsilon in the first place, because we do not have really a perfect fit to, with, with our x variables to y. So there's always some kind of unexplained uh, uh, variation in, in this uh, dependent variable y. So this is the main rationale to have this uh, epsilon in the first place. Uh, but now we are talking about such kind of um, omitted variable x3, which uh, has rather major influence on the dependent variable. So, so there is not such kind of clear cut rule when, when this omitted variable becomes a problem that, uh, that, uh, but it's good to understand that, okay, what happens if we do, uh, exclude some exploratory variables and they end up to the, to the error term epsilon. So here I have just, uh, just, uh, uh recap some of the ideas from the previous lessons already. So uh, notice that in that case, if we then render this, uh, this, um, this uh, variable x3 to the error term epsilon, so we can, we can think of this uh, error term. And for clarity, I have then uh, distinguished uh, epsilon of this uh, theoretical model and epsilon prime is then this, uh, this uh, version, which includes also the uh, variable x3 and beta3. So then of course, this, uh, this, uh, rules for that that we have for the OLS estimate to still apply so we can write uh, b2 e as equal to beta2 plus uh, sample covariance of x2 and epsilon prime divided by sample variance of x2 but further we can we can then uh, break down this uh, sample covariance of x2 and x3 to the two parts and uh, and uh, 
I have here highlighted with the blue color that, uh, that then in that case, we also get out this impact of uh, beta three times sample covariance of X2 and X3 divided by sample variance of X2. And then we have this usual kind of uh, uh, error component with the sample covariance of X2 and epsilon. So notice that, uh, that then the correlation between X2 and X3 is really, really critical here if the, how large the omitted variable bias will be, because it depends on the uh, sample covariance of X2 and X3, and it also depends on, the, on this uh, coefficient beta 3 of the omitted variable, and also it depends on the sample variance of, uh, of X2. So, therefore, we can also then uh, quantify that what is the, how, how big is the bias? So, 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 if we take the expected value of B2 and subtract beta 3, then, uh, and, and we now assume that, uh, that X2 is uncorrelated with epsilon, so, so uh, really the only source of the bias is this omitted, omitted variable X3. So then the bias would be equal to the expected value of B2 minus beta 2, so that would be equal to beta 3 times covariance of X2 and, X2 and X3 divided by variance of X2. And uh, this formulation also helps to clarify uh, clarify some uh, some things. So, so in the case of the omitted variable bias, we don't really know is it uh, is it um, positive or negative. It could be either way. So, of course, sign of this this beta three could be either positive or negative, and also the correlation between x two and x three could be positive or negative. So. Um, so in that means that the omitted variable bias could have uh, either positive bias or negative bias. And uh, if we don't know the sign of the beta three coefficient, or we don't know the sign of the correlation, then we don't know which direction the bias bias might be. Sometimes it might be possible to guess if we have some idea that uh, whether this uh, X2 and X3 have a positive correlation or, or negative correlation. So that was just to clarify the, the omitted variable bias. And uh, in the next, uh, next lesson, I will then, uh, then uh, talk about the measurement errors. And then in the following, uh, we will go to the simultaneity bias. And then, then we consider the instrumental variables to how to deal with this kind of uh, omitted variable bias. But the conclusion regarding the omitted variable bias is that, uh, of course, um, sometimes we, we have to omit some variables because perhaps data doesn't doesn't exist. So in that sense, it's good to understand that uh, what kind of issues it might cause to those variables that uh, that are included in the in the model. And, and that's really the main purpose of to being aware of the of the omitted variable bias. And also, uh, already in the previous lesson, I highlighted that uh, in terms of the modeling strategy, that it's not good idea to uh, ex exclude variables, even if they turn out to be insignificant in the in the statistical testing because then uh, then omitting some variables that should be in the model then uh, might cause some bias to those uh, those explanatory variables that we choose to include in the model so we'll continue then to the to the measurement errors in the next lesson